Yerushalayim, Erecho, Rachamim, Eshu. The Sishkon, the Socho, Asher di Barto, Yerushalayim, Erecho, Rachamim, Eshu. The Sishkon, the Socho, and hello friends welcome welcome i'm glad that you're here i am rabbi shlomo nachman bin yaakov formerly known as shlomo phillips ahuva will be joining us in just a couple of moments and i am very glad that you are here welcome 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 I want to welcome uh, Lily Coopers, Veronica Port, Patty W. Smith, Hannah Lewis, Ahuva, uh, my dear friend David Bozart, uh, Veronica Port, Kathy Hamlet, Stephen Baum, Louis Enrique Fritas Patua, uh, Sonia Hilalgo Zarita, and Sandra Morel, and anyone else who joins us during the process as. Um, as we take off here this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome to each and every one of you. Ahuva and I today are going to be starting a new book, which is uh, one of my very favorite books of all, called The Garden of Imuna uh, by Rabbi Shalom Arush. We're going to be reading from the third edition. A um, little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. And here is Ahuva. Um, <coughs> hopefully you can, we're both fitting on the screen. I think we are. That's better. Um, <laughs> so, uh, welcome Kelly Smith as well. So welcome Ahuva. Hello. Thank you. Before we get started, however, um, there's breaking news coming from Israel and there is something that I wanted to share with you. Um, one of our friends in Israel posted the following this morning. So, usually I'm happy to get on after Shabbat. I guess it was actually last night. Usually I'm happy to get online after Shabbat and find out what I've missed during our 25-hour time out. Last night, I would have preferred, I would have been happier not logging in again. Some 200 rockets and mortars were fired at southern communities from the Gaza Strip and four civilians were injured. The toll would have, been much, would have been a lot higher had the Iron Dome not intercepted 30 of those rockets. And of course, this is on top of the devastation to Israel farms and nature reserves in the south caused by Hamas arsonists. Um, for a close-up look at what has been happening, click a link that she shares. I'm going to be posting that link here uh, I thought I had it, had it there. Okay. I'm going to be posting this link in the chat screen, um, and I would encourage you all to uh, to check it out, perhaps after the broadcast. It's also on, um, wow, that's really long. Easiest way to do it, go to my homepage, go to the, uh, the this my wall here at Facebook, and you'll see it there. I just posted it. Um, it's called Man Survives Hamas Rocket Attack as Three Israelis Wounded When Wounded Home When Home Directly Hit. So um, this is is a very serious matter um, for Israel, and of course um, we are always the Jews are always hated. Everything is our fault, <laughs> and we're just the eternal scapegoats. We all know that. But this time of year particularly, this is important. We're still in the three weeks. It'll be ending shortly. And we're moving up towards the ninth of Av. And I'd like to just share, before we get started with the Garden of Amuna, not to defeat your Amuna, but to demonstrate why Amuna is so very important. This is taken from Chabad.org, but I'm just going to be reading you these basic headlines to let you know what happened on the ninth of Av. The ninth of Av, by the way, will begin uh, at nightfall July 21st, and it will conclude at nightfall Sunday the 22nd. So this is next week um, when the ninth of Av will occur. 
I assure you that many of our enemies are very acquainted with the ninth of Av. This is the date they would love to do some serious harm to our people and our nation. So what happened so far on the ninth of Av? Tisha B'Av, as we call it. The spies returned with a bad report when Moshe sent them out to spy out the land. That occurred on the ninth of Av. Many rabbis uh, believe that because of the lack of faith expressed by most of the spies is where this whole process got started. Both of our holy temples were destroyed. The first and second temple were destroyed on Tisha B'Av. The battle of Bitar was lost on the 9th of Av. The Romans plowed the Beit HaMikdash down, the temple in Jerusalem in 70 CE, on uh, Tisha B'Av that year. The Jews were expelled from England on Tisha B'Av in the year 1290 CE. The Jews were banished from Spain on Tisha B'Av in the year 1492. Both world wars began. Know that? Both world wars began on Tisha B'Av and so on. So Tisha B'Av um, Rabbi A mentioned an interesting comment the other day. People were saying that it was the it was uh, last Friday was Friday the thirteenth, and he explained how that's just a superstition. The nation's actually for Jews thirteen is a pretty good number. For us, however, the ninth of Av is not a particularly auspicious date. And as we're moving towards that date, you've been noticing the increase in attacks going on in Jerusalem. Um, for this reason. Um, I would like to encourage all of us to be in extra prayers for the people of Israel, for Jerusalem, for the Jews all over the world, because oftentimes these attacks are not limited to the Jews living in Eretz Israel. Oftentimes, anti-Semitic activities increase around the world. So please, 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 for the next week especially, be in prayer for the people of Jerusalem and the people of Israel as we approach the ninth of Av. What is our protection from these attacks? Well, my friend mentioned that the Iron Dome caught 30 of the missiles that came in. Baruch Hashem for the Iron Dome. Wonderful thing. Israeli border patrols doubtless stopped all kinds of problems from happening and praise God, Baruch Hashem for them. And the Israeli medics were on scene to help the people who were wounded. Uh, praise God for them. The Israeli fire departments, were, I'm sure, were there when the house was hit to help them out and so on. Um, but really, our help comes from one place. Our help comes from Hashem. That's where it comes from. It doesn't come from anywhere else. Every Jew, no matter where they live on this planet of ours, have one thing in common. We worship the God of Israel. And the God of Israel <clears throat> is committed and has promised that we Jews will survive. Now I want to note something that a lot of you may not know, and I was really happy to hear Rabbi A mention this the other day. The Israel that now exists is not the Israel foretold by the prophets. The Israel foretold by the prophets can never be destroyed. This Israel could be destroyed. How can we keep that from happening? Prayer, hit but a dude, an increase in amuna, an increase in faith, an increase in observance, an increase in looking to Hashem as our sole protector. Baruch Hashem, America stands with Israel. But you know what? America is not what makes Israel still exist. Hashem is what makes Israel still exist. America actually gets more blessings out of our relationship than Israel does, to be quite honest with you. Baruch Hashem, Israel has friends, a lot of friends. But our hope is only in Hashem. And that hope is manifested when we manifest our imuna, our active faith and trust in Hashem. Welcome to our friend Susan Connor. Glad that you're here, Susan. And to uh, Higinyi Arisa. I probably messed up your first name. I apologize. Higinyi Yurisa, glad that you're here. And Peter Bosch is here as well. So, with that uh, sort of dark preface, we're going to begin the new book, The Garden of Amuna. Not a new book, but a new book of uh, studying it here. This is actually the third time that I've done this book. 
but it's the first time that I've done this book on Facebook Live. The other two times were audio pods, which for various technical reasons, both unfortunately got erased. So we're going to be starting the Garden of Amuna today. Welcome to uh, Peter Bosch and to um, Kenneth Waldman. Now, I want to make um, this very, very clear on the beginning episode. I don't do this every episode, but I want to on the beginning. This book was written by Rabbi Shalom Arush. This book was translated, if you can see it, by Rabbi Lazer Brody. Um, they hold the copyright laws. They hold the protections. They hold everything. I am reading this book. We're reading this book with their mercy and their direct permission given to us when we were in Israel in 2013. I asked if I could do this, and I was told it would be considered a wonderful mitzvah for us to share this, particularly this, as well as Rabbi Shalom Arush's other works. So that's what we're doing um, here. I share Rabbi Arush's books probably more than I do anyone else's. I love his books. I love the way he presents his material. Um, my uh, thing here jumped. Uh, welcome to Deborah Mayhew. I'm glad that you're here as well. So all copyright is, is maintained exclusively by Rabbi Shalom Arush and the Chut Shel Chesed institutions of Israel. We are in no way, shape, or form infringing. We are reading the books with their stated permission and blessings. And so as you're hearing this book, or if you read along with us, you too are enjoying the blessings of Shalom Arush for us going through his work. And I want to make that really, really clear. If you haven't yet purchased the book, please do. This book will change your life. I say that about a few different books. This one, I say it more than any other book. This book will change your life. This book will put you in the right direction, as you'll see as we go through it. So I hope you will purchase it if you haven't already gotten it. If you're going to buy it, again, you want to buy the third edition, A Practical Guide to Life, the Enlarged Edition. So, hi Barbara, glad that you're here. Um, having said that, let's go ahead and get started on page 13 with the translator's forward. The translator being Rabbi Lazer Brody. I'm going to ask Ahuva who is getting ready to leave. No, I'm here. You I'm need here. to go somewhere? No. Nope. Okay. I'm going to ask Ahuva to get us started with the translator's forward. Rabbi Shalom Arush has helped more people overcome more problems in stress-ridden Israel than anyone else. His smile is a sunburst through thick gray clouds, and his words are a cool drink on a parched soul. He is the master physician of the soul who adeptly cures all people's ills with one secret spiritual remedy, Emuna, the pure and complete faith in the Almighty. Over a decade ago, Rabbi Shalom Arush hired me to become the dean of Ashdod branch of his renowned rabbinical seminary. Uh, hang on just a second, Huva. Uh, see if you can hear her better now. Okay, is, yeah, I can, on the screen, can you bump me up? You should be number two. Say something, no. Testing, one, two, three. Uh, is this better? Volume check. Could someone please let me know if this is better or not? Remember, it's going to take a minute for the delay to go through. And silence is so much fun. Okay. Um, if you can hear Huva now screen. better, would a you please tell time. her? It looks better on our screen. I had her uh, her mic cut down a little bit. It's red lining. Okay, that should be fine. Or okay. Better. Barbara says better. I'll okay. keep my mouth on the mic. That's a little hard. Okay. Would you start over again then? Rabbi Shalom Arush has helped more people overcome more problems in stress-ridden Israel than anyone alive. His smile is a sunburst through thick gray clouds, and his words are a cool drink on a parched soul. He is the master physician of the soul who adeptly cures all people's ills with one secret spiritual remedy, Amuna, the pure and complete faith in the Almighty. Over a decade ago, Rabbi Shalom Arush hired me to become the dean of the Ashdod branch of his renowned rabbinical seminary, Chut Shel Chesed. My task was to teach rabbinical law to a group of aspiring young men. Little did I realize 
that my teaching career would become the greatest learning experience of my life. Rabbi Shalom was never satisfied with building a student's mind. He stressed that a healthy soul is the only worthy spiritual receptacle for the wisdom of Torah. He encouraged me to augment our daily studies in Talmud and religious law with ethics and the works of the great Hasidic masters, particularly those of history's greatest doctor of the soul, our revered master, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, who lived 1772 to 1810, of saintly, blessed memory. Once a week, Rabbi Shalom would come from Jerusalem to Ashdod and deliver a talk to the seminary students. He'd elaborate on Rabbi Nachman's teachings and their practical applications in our daily lives. Wide-eyed and dumbstruck, I would sit open-mouthed in the first row, savoring each syllable. Listening to Rabbi Shalom, the dean felt like an empty-headed little boy. My feeling of empty-headedness proved to be a blessing. By casting aside my preconceptions and my sorely limited intellect, I made room in my head for Rabbi Shalom's wisdom. Fine wine tastes best when poured into a clean and empty glass. From the moment I nullified my own brain and internalized Rabbi Shalom's teachings, I experienced enhanced blessings of success in virtually every area of my life. <coughs> Excuse me. Every word of his lessons was spiritual money in the bank. But better than money, the lessons I've learned from Rabbi Shalom have become priceless assets for posterity that I hope to share with you, dear reader. One can easily fill an entire separate volume with the praises of Rabbi Shalom. Notwithstanding, his five greatest attributes are his phenomenal humility, his ability to bring the lofty teachings of Rabbi Nachman to the eye level of this generation, his practice of every iota of what he teaches, his unshakable amuna, and his smile. Rabbi Shalom's popularity has mushroomed all over Israel, spilling outside of Israel's borders as well. In answering the overseas demand for his teachings, Rabbi Shalom called on me to translate his lectures and books into English. The Garden of Amuna was our first project after its Hebrew forefather, Bagan Ha'emuna, took Israel by storm. Since then, Rabbi Shalom's books have become bestsellers in the English-speaking world as well. Two years have transcribed, or ten, two years have transpired since we came out with the first edition of the Garden of Amuna. With Hashem's loving grace, the book's momentum continues to grow. We've received amazing feedback from across the globe. People from all walks of life have attested that this book has dramatically changed their lives for the best. Throughout the original translation and the two subsequent revisions of this book, Rabbi Shalom implored me to make sure that the Garden of Amuna retains its universal nature. As such, the book has been just as popular in the general public as among its Jewish readers. This third edition contains important additions that, Shalom, or that Rabbi Shalom felt necessary to include. He stresses that this is not a one-shot pleasure reading book, but a guidebook for life that one must read over and over until the contents become completely internalized and second nature. With Hashem's loving guidance, I've tried my utmost to preserve the flavor and intent of Rabbi Shalom's original sweet words. Even so, any deficiency in this book is surely that of the translator and not of the author. Grand Rabbi Naftali Moskowitz of Melitz had been a beacon of advice and encouragement whose guidance had been vital to the publication of this book. The moving force behind this project is Rabbi Shalom Arush himself, who so selflessly has illuminated my mind and soul with his noble teachings. To them, my esteemed teachers and spiritual guides, I express my deepest gratitude. May Hashem bless them and their families with the very best of spiritual and material abundance always. Sherry Perlis of Los Angeles has devoted his valuable talents and time in proofreading this edition. May Hashem bless him with all his heart's wishes for the very best always. To my cherished wife, Yehudit, we both know that the credit for this book and everything else I do belongs exclusively to you. May Hashem bless you with long and happy days, success, and joy from all your offspring. May they walk courageously in the path of Torah and Amuna until the end of time. Amen. Amen. Three times a day. At the conclusion of the Elenu prayer, 
we express our yearning for the day when all flesh shall call your name. Our hope and prayer is that the Garden of Amuna shall do its part to hasten that glorious day. With a song of thanks to the Almighty and a prayer for the full and speedy redemption of our people Yisrael, Laser Brody, Ashdod, Tishrei 5769. Amen. <clears throat> I want to welcome um, Ina Kay and Guy Bratowski. Glad that you're both here with us today. And uh, Kelly Smith, I don't think I said hi to you. I may have. Glad that you're here. Abe Cohen is also joining us. <coughs> We're currently reading the foreword to the book, The Garden of Amuna, which is the new book that Hoover and I will be presenting Bezit Hashem each Sunday at 12 noon Eastern U.S. time on my Facebook wall. We're beginning now on page 16. A personal request from the author. Dear reader, during the course of my work and my daily contact with people from around the world who seek my advice and help, I've come to the clear conclusion that the root of all human suffering is none other than a lack of emuna the pure and unshakable faith in the Almighty. Time and again, I've witnessed how people have overcome seemingly insurmountable personal problems by strengthening Imuna. That was my motivation in writing this book that dealt exclusively with Imuna. If my sole desire was to write a book that defines Imuna and lauds its virtues, I wouldn't bother. Thank God, there are many books on the market that do so already, better than I could do. But my entire objective in this modest volume is to bring the reader to the unequivocal conclusion that he or she needs to strengthen his or her immuna, and that by doing so, the reader can look forward to a new, happier, and more fulfilling life in this world and and the next. <clears throat> I'd like to just add a little parenthesis here. The reason for what I do, and I mentioned this on uh, the new, newly updated page at allfaith.com, is I want to reach out to people who don't feel that anybody cares about them, but very similar to Shalom Arush. We're not trying to preach to you. We're not trying to make converts. The purpose here truly is to give wisdom that will help you as an individual make your life happier and more joyful and more productive. That's why we do everything we do both at uh, allfaith.com and also at the House of Seven Beggars. And I can tell you from first-hand knowledge, that is what Shalom Arush also has as his heart's desire. We're simply here to try to help. <clears throat> and I just want to make that very, very clear. Shalom Arush did not write these books to make money. He wrote these books to try to help people, genuinely and sincerely. Welcome to Dennis Akola. Glad you made it, Dennis. We're on page 16 of The Garden of Amuna enlarged third edition a personal request from the author for example do you have financial problems your amuna needs reinforcement you don't even have to pray for a better income rather pray for amuna and your income will improve automatically is your marriage on the rocks pray for amuna and your marital you'll have marital bliss too do you suffer from emotional problems? Strengthening your amuna is the best assurance in the world for emotional health. The same goes for every other problem in life. Those, who, those fortunate individuals who succeed in learning the amuna, who succeed in learning that amuna is the master key to opening any door in life, devote their principal stress. Let me start that over again. I apologize. <clears throat> they don't devote their stress. <laughs> <laughs> Those fortunate individuals who succeed in learning that Amuna is the master key to opening any door in life devote their principal time and efforts to attaining Amuna. With Amuna, you'll see how stress and despair become a life of satisfaction, challenge, and accomplishment. More than anything else, Amuna will grant you happiness and inner peace. What could be better? My humble request is that you read this book carefully while trying your best to apply its advice to your daily routine. 
I'm sure that this book will help you to attain an enhanced measure of Amuna in your life. If so, then all of my efforts have been worthwhile. I entitled this book The Garden of Imuna, alluding to the fact that Imuna leads to a life as beautiful as a scroll down a stroll down an enchanted path of lush exotic gardens. In fact, Imuna has the power to help a person blossom into his or her very best. Rebbe Nachman of Breslov calls Imuna the power of growth. Nothing in this world is as conducive to a person's personal growth and development as Imuna. I dedicate this book to my honored father, Mashluf Arush, a blessed memory, whose pure and simple faith and impeccable character forever remain a shining beacon that illumines my path. My sincere thanks go to my esteemed teacher and spiritual guide, Rabbi Eliezer Berman, who, by the way, I was honored to meet in 2013. May Hashem grant him long and happy days, from, where, from whose sweet waters I drink and from whose magnificent spirit I draw the spirit to sp the strength to spread the message of Jewish outreach around the world. Amen and Amen. The wisdom in this book can only be traced directly to Rabbi Berlin's phenomenal teachings. A special note of gratitude goes to my wife, Miriam Varda. May Hashem bless her with long and happy and healthy life, joy from her offspring and success in all of her endeavors. She stands by my side always and deserves all the credit for any accomplishments. Her dedication to Jewish outreach knows no bound, and surely her rewards shall be great, both in this world and in the next. May she see joy uh, from her offspring, and may their children and their children's children sincerely devote their lives to Torah and Amuna until the end of days. Amen. My dear mother toiled selflessly to raise her children with love and compassion. May it be Hashem's will that she merit continued long, healthy, and happy years, seeing all of her offspring growing to be upright and glorious trees in Hashem's loving orchard, lovely orchard, until the full redemption of our people. Amen. My appreciation and blessings go out to the distinguished scholar, Rabbi Yehoshua Cohen, author of Karim Yehoshua, who so graciously assisted with his comments, suggestions, and critiques of the original manuscript version of this book. The original Hebrew version of this book would never have seen the light of day without the trusty help of Rabbi Yaakov Hertzberg, who has toiled days and nights in getting all of my ideas down onto paper. May the mercy of this product, project stand to his credit always, and may he see joy from his offspring and success in all of their endeavors. The English version of this book became a reality thanks to the steadfast support of my de very dear friend, Mr. Lior Tamir of Los Angeles, California. May Hashem bless him with the very best of spiritual and material blessings always. And my heartfelt gratitude goes out to Rabbi Eliezer Raphael Laser Brody, the dynamic author of P. Habier. Nif Shi Tidom, The Trail to Tranquility, and Laser Beams, his web journal, who has so selflessly dedicated himself to spreading my teachings across the four corners of the earth of the English speaking earth, and particularly for the translation and adaptation of the Garden of Amuna. May Hashem bless him with strength for his continued efforts in the Jewish outreach, success to all of his endeavors, and joy from all his offspring. And lastly, but certainly not the least, my thanks goes to Rabbi Aitan Sofiof and Rabbi Yosef Nachman, nah, Nach, Nachama, who toiled tirelessly so that this book would become a reality. May Hashem bless them and theirs with all the very best in spiritual and material abundance. I cast my prayer to the living God that he shall fulfill my wish. May all, this means you folks, May all who read this book strive for a Muna. I bless all of you, dear readers, that your learning in this book will help you to cling to Hashem. May your troubles disappear, and may you merit a personal redemption of body and soul, as well as long and happy lives. May we all witness the ingathering of the exiles and the rebuilding of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem 
speedily and in our days. And we say, Amen. Shalom Arush, Yerushalayim, El- Elul 5766. <clears throat> so that is the basic introduction to the book. <clears throat> Before we uh, continue, I'd like to welcome Paul Corius. If anyone has any particular questions about Imuna or about Rabbi Arush or comments, or anything like that before we get started, I would welcome those right now in the chat screen or by Ahuva. I'd also welcome feedback about volume levels, whether um, Shlomo and I have similar volume level or his is louder or, you know, can you hear us both? Because this book really is major and it can change your life. And the reason we're doing this is we want to share what's had an impact on us. Amen. Thank you, Ahuva. So... We will go ahead with Chapter 1, Foundations of Imuna, Life's Riddles, uh, with a hoover, because I was reading last. Okay. I think that's me. You're the second one here. Okay. All right. Chapter 1, Foundations of Imuna, Life's Riddles. This world is full of questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. Susan said, Shlomo is louder, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Whoop. Now I bet that evens it out. I turned myself up and moved his mic a little further back. <laughs> All right, let's see if this is better. But you got a hairy face. You think so? I wonder how that happened. <laughs> Life's riddles. <laughs> this world is full of questions. What is the meaning of life? Where am I going? What will be in the end? How should I live my life? Will I ever be happy? The list is endless. The drastic and seemingly unfair differences between one person's life and another's frequently perplex us. One person seems to glide on easy street while another person lives a life of excruciating hardships. One person is born with strength and perfect health while another is feeble and crippled. One is rich, yet another is poor. A kind person that never harmed a fly dies young, while a ruthless tyrant reigns until a ripe old age. Why? Those who ask the most questions are the ones who suffer the most. The person with a limited income asks, Why does so-and-so have plenty of money even though I work just as hard? I go crazy trying to make ends meet. The parent of a sickly child asks, Why does everyone have strong and healthy children, and I have the hard luck of raising a child that needs round-the-clock medical supervision? The handicapped person asks, Why is everyone so beautifully free and agile while I'm so repulsively limited and impaired? The poor look at the rich and ask, Why do they deserve a silver spoon when our lives are never-ending war with poverty and deprivation? The lonely individual that can't seem to find a spouse asks, Why am I, with all my good qualities, unable to get married? Yet others with all their faults find perfect spouses at a young age. That's not all. Changing times. We have an additional array of questions about the changes in our lives from day to day. Here are a few familiar examples. Why was yesterday such a splendid day when everything went according to plan while today, for no apparent reason, everything's a disaster and I feel nothing but pain and sorrow? Why did I have plenty of money in my pocket last week, yet this week's unexpected expenses have left me without enough to buy a loaf of bread? Why did I gleam phenomenal joy from my children yesterday, who were the epitome of respect and deportment? Yet today, they've become miniature terrorists driving me up the wall. The list is endless, as we all know. The universal answer? All of life's questions have one universal answer, Amuna. Amuna is like a master key to life's locked dilemmas. Amuna is the original biblical Hebrew term for a firm belief in a single supreme omniscient, benevolent, spiritual, supernatural, and all-powerful creator of the universe, which we refer to as God, or Hashem, which literally means the name, so that we don't risk using God's name in vain. 
He alone cares for each of us in a unique, tailor-made fashion according to our own individual needs. As we shall see throughout this book, everything that happens to us in life is the product of Hashem's will and personal intervention in our lives, which we shall often refer to as divine providence. Divine providence is designed to help us perform our task in life. Divine providence not only determines events on a global scale, it dictates the tiniest details in the universe, such as the evening meal of a worm. Our lives in their entirety, including each individual moment, are the outcome of Hashem's divine providence-oriented decision. Hashem decides when we succeed and when we fail, when times are easy and when they're hard. According to Kabbalah, or Jewish esoteric thought, completing one's soul correction or tikkun is the loftiest achievement a person can accomplish in this material world. Oftentimes, we must suffer or experience hardship in order to attain a higher spiritual level or a correction to the soul, just like a champion athlete must withstand excruciating training sessions to reach higher achievements in peak performance. Once we develop a deep sense of emuna that Hashem, by way of divine providence, does everything for our ultimate benefit to guide us on the path of our needed soul correction, then the puzzle pieces of life suddenly come together in a picture of striking clarity. With these principles in mind, emuna becomes the universal answer to all of life's questions. Amen. I'd like to welcome my fr <clears throat> my friend from many, many years back, Kathy Ivester Whitworth is here. Hey. Hey, Kathy. And Mary DeHart has also joined us. Glad you're here, Mary. And also Donald Willinger. And also Donald Willinger. Donald wasn't hey. feeling too well, and I'm glad he was able to get some sleep. But I'm also glad you woke up so you could join us, Donald. I hope you're feeling better. Um, and uh, so we are on page 23 now of the Garden of Amuna by Rabbi Shalom Arush, translated by Rabbi Lazer Brody, third edition, page one, uh, page 23 at the bottom. Getting to know Hashem. Essentially, Hashem has only one simple request from each of us, that we get to know Him. According to the Holy Zohar, the second century CE esoteric interpretation of the Torah by Rabbi Shimon or Shimon Bar Yochai and his disciples, Hashem created us for the sole purpose of getting to know him. Isn't that a wonderful thought? That's what he, he wants to know us, get it to know you. I love that. As such, the daily events and experiences of our lives are none other than personal messages from Hashem, designed to stimulate our emuna, to encourage us to speak to him, and thereby to facilitate our efforts to get close to Him. Why? Because the closer we get to Hashem, the better we come to know Him. Achieving proximity to God and thereby getting to know Him are the ultimate and the, are the ultimate soul correction, our individual soul and mission on this earth. Hashem, in His limitless love for each of us, directs our lives in a manner that helps us to successfully achieve this goal. Understanding the vital fact that everything in our lives is for our own ultimate good, that is, to help us achieve soul correction, enables us to cope with all types of situations, whether seemingly good or seemingly bad, happily and without stress, worry, and anxiety. Consequently, when people ignore Hashem's personal messages, Hashem is compelled to send them a louder message. In other words, situations of greater difficulty. Those who fail to get to know Hashem in good times risk being placed in predicaments devoid of any natural or logical solution, where the only remaining alternative will be to cry out to Hashem. In this manner, Hashem, in His infinite loving kindness, helps each one of us to reach Him and thereby to achieve our ultimate soul corrections. The more we cooperate, the easier our lives become. Hashem reproves those He loves. The Zohar at Bechokotai 114 states, 
How beloved are the children of Israel before the Holy One, blessed be he. He desires to reprove them and to lead them on the straight path, like a loving father who wields a rod in hand in order to lead the son on the straight path, so that the son will not stray to the right nor to the left, as it is written at Proverbs 3.12, Hashem reproves those he loves, and like a father he mollifies the child. Ponder this above proverb for a moment. If Hashem reproves those he loves, inversely, he doesn't reprove those he hates. If so, a life devoid of trials and tribulations really is not a very good sign. Our Talmudic sages warn at Tractate Arachan 16b that if a person has 40 consecutive days free of tribulations, he or she forfeits their share in the world to come. Now, you're going to hear some statements here that are somewhat extreme. They're sayings. They're not to be meant to be taken that literally. If you have a really good few, several weeks, don't worry. That means God has abandoned you. Um, that's one of the things that you're just going to have to learn about Jewish authors. Continuing. They also stated specifically at Tractate Kiddushim 40b that the righteous receive tribulations in order to merit a lofty place in the world to come. So, when we experience difficulties in life, it's a clear sign that, we're being, that we are a beloved son or daughter of Hashem. Knowing that Hashem loves us and that He does everything for our benefit makes life not only bearable but gratifying. The contrary also holds true. Ignorance of the fact that Hashem loves us is helping us to attain our needed tikkun in the root of all suffering, worry, and anxiety. Those with Amuna, therefore, direct their efforts to achieving their tikkun and focus on getting to know Hashem. Such individuals are constantly seeking Hashem. As a result, Hashem doesn't need to send them superfluous wake-up calls that manifest themselves in the form of extreme tribulations. Amuna people, con people consequently live happy and tranquil lives regardless of their life trials and challenges. Boy, that would be nice. Wouldn't it? <laughs> I am I'm, not there. <laughs> I'm actually, it was remembering, I wasn't going to say anything, but <laughs> when we were coming back from Wolverine Campground, where I got my sneak in, we had this incredible time with wonderful people, some of whom are here with us today. We stopped at a gas station for gas, and I put my hand in my pocket for my wallet, and there was no wallet. I know that's where I have my wallet. So... We're thinking, well, maybe you left it in the basket that was on the picnic table. So we get out. We unloaded the entire van looking for my wallet. Now, I got to admit, my first thought was not Baruch Hashem. My first thought was, oi, we are <laughs> in trouble. What are we going to do? Because I've got all that we can put on credit card, her credit card. But I got all the money for the trip home. What are we going to do? And I went up towards the front of the van and I asked Hashem. I said, Hashem, we're in trouble here. And it, 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 it just hit me. God, Hashem told me, if, in, in, for all intents and purposes, to look in the, the, there's like a little sidebar on my door, right? Like a little side box on my door. And there's my wallet. And then I remembered, I put it in my wallet, but I was afraid that sitting down, it might jostle out and fall out. So I put it where it would be safe. We unloaded the entire van. What we should have done is we should have immediately stopped and approached Hashem and said, Hashem, okay, where'd you hide it? Where's the wallet? <laughs> I will say the van was much better packed afterwards, and if we had to hit our brakes, everything stayed put. It was. When we left the campground, she was a little bit concerned that we hadn't, that I hadn't really loaded it quite. I wanted to get home by that point. Yeah. It was all in there. What else matters? <laughs> so, and it was all in there. It was all in there. And Baruch I don't Hashem. think it would have fallen, but you don't know. So, Baruch Hashem, maybe we needed to do that. <laughs> Because otherwise, something else would have happened. You never know. And maybe it saved us a few hours traffic. I mean, there's just way more to this story than we know. Yeah, yeah. And there was a lot of really weird traffic issues on the way home that could have posed a serious problem that Bezra Hashem didn't, or Baruch Hashem didn't. So, um, <laughs> like she said, we, we need to learn this, <laughs> this lesson, too. It's easy sometimes, and sometimes, you know, you have to remember. It's, it's a work. We are a work in progress. Amen. Oh, I want to welcome uh, Veronique 
Elefante Yanni, and Glenn Short, uh, Schmoyer. Boris Gazzo has joined us. My friend Stephen Ewing and Caesar or Cesar Valderrama is here. Stephen says shalom. Shalom. We're on page 25 at the almost the bottom of the page, uh, the Garden of Amuna. I got us off track a little bit. <laughs> Dennis says, I'm usually tranquil. Tell me about it. <laughs> unless I watch political news. <laughs> I, I can't anymore. I just, I can't. I get too mad. Um, it's entertainment news, and it's, there used to be occasional talk shows where people sort of shouted each other down, and it was entertaining, mm -hmm. and there were points. But what happened to real news? <laughs> Yep, that's one of our things. Because to me, news is like, watching the news is like future history. I mean, these are the things, especially what's happening right now in the United States. Some of these things are going to be talked about forever. We're getting to witness them. But I end up watching TV on my computer sometimes <laughs> to save her the energy. But uh, so continuing. Uh, I, I've always had this sense, by the way, that those kind of things that drive a lot of people, and I understand why it would drive you crazy, um, but one of the things that, um, one of the things that, uh, that I always think about is that I'm watching how Hashem is organizing these things. And sometimes it really is amazing. Someone that I knew was a crook. You should see the stuff I was posting on Comey long before this current mess when Hillary was still a viable candidate for the presidency. Um, and now to see that these people are likely going to jail just makes my heart sing. Uh, maybe they shouldn't, but justice is now finally being done. Um, I don't want to get off into politics too much. Yeah, we're, we're trying not to be one-sided. Everybody's got their yeah. own views. This is not the place. Yeah. Susan says Fox. Yeah, Fox is one of my main news sources as well. Narendra Dande says hi and shalom. Mary says uh, shalom to him. <coughs> Dennis, excuse me. Dennis says, I got a <laughs> quit tool. <laughs> is there a 30-day program? Oddly enough, hey, this is the cure for everything. Amuna, Amuna, Amuna. True. And I'm working on a 49-day quick plan book, which hopefully I'll be getting published one of these days, based on my presentation to the Omer count. So there are things happening in that area, Dennis. <laughs> Susan says, they're wrong go to jail again we don't want to get too political i want to but i don't want to here kelly says uh, sorry i didn't say hello back no worries all right so we are going to finish the last paragraph on page 25 of the garden of amuna so many people in modern society entertain the folly that they alone control their fate these people are prime candidates for suffering and emotional ills hashem our loving father uses the rod of tribulations as an expression of love to teach us that we're not calling the shots, but subservient to a higher authority. Also, to awaken his beloved children for their spiritual slumber. Hashem oftentimes gives us a jolt in the form of some difficulty or challenge that forces us to seek his help. As we said earlier, Hashem doesn't send difficulties to those he dislikes. the rod and the staff. Rebbe Nachman of Breslov teaches at Likutei Maharan 1, 206, that Hashem immediately calls out to a person that strays from the proper path, beckoning that individual to return. Hashem summons each person in a tailor-made fashion and in accordance with that person's needs. For some, Hashem's call may be a subtle hint for one person, yet a vocal reprimand for others. A louder call might assume the form of physical punishment. In the jargon of our sages, a whisper suffices for the wise, but a fool needs flagellation. Even extreme handicaps are for a person's own good. Hashem alone knows what a soul must correct, and thereby places each soul in a circumstance that is conducive for its necessary tikkun or soul correction. As we are usually unaware of our needed tikkun, we sometimes make wrong choices or entertain useless aspirations. Hashem helps us modify our plans to prevent us from wasting our lives on folly and fantasy. For example, let's suppose that a person, left to his or her own will, would have aspired to be a professional singer. But as a singer, that person wouldn't possibly achieve his or her required tikkun. 
As such, Hashem causes that person to be born with a raspy voice. Yet, the raspy voice doesn't hamper the person from becoming an outstanding teacher or spiritual leader that inspires thousands of people, their real tikkun. Hashem closes those doors that aren't beneficial to our souls, yet opens the doors that lead us to what is best for each of us, to keep us on a focused and directed path in life. Without his divine guidance, we'd be totally lost. At this point, people usually ask, if everything is in Hashem's hands, then what's my job on this earth? Good question. Our task is to develop our spiritual antenna and to discern by correctly processing Hashem's personal messages to us what Hashem wants from each of us. Hashem constantly communicates with us via our environment, telling us where he desires to take us and to what objective. Even though these hints, or heavenly messengers, are frequently clothed in sorrow, hardship, and deprivation, they're actually the epitome of perfect loving kindness. How? How? Sorrow, hardship, and deprivation are perfect loving kindnesses when they're agents that bring about one's tikkun, the correction and perfection of the soul, the greatest achievement on earth. When we accept life's difficulties with Imuna, calmly and happily, knowing that Hashem is doing everything to help us achieve the loftiest of aspirations, we become candidates for eternal happiness and inner peace in this world and in the next. An athlete is prepared to implement grueling demands from a seemingly merciless coach. Not only that, but a top athlete usually loves and respects his or her coach. Why? The athlete knows the coach and trusts that the coach wants to build him or her into a winner and a champion. We should have the same knowledge of and trust in Hashem. Imagine we're driving a car and we want to make a right turn, but Hashem blocks the way. We decide to make a left turn, but Hashem sets up an obstacle to block that way also. Without Amuna, we'd be subject to anger, frustration, and disappointment. But with Amuna... We believe that life's stumbling blocks, barriers, and hindrances are agents of Hashem's divine providence. We don't sink to frustration, anger, and depression when armed with the knowledge that life's setbacks are milestones, guiding lights, and personal gifts from Hashem. Um, I'd like to welcome um, Crystal Lang, who's joined us, and Asedu Natan is here. Welcome from Ghana. Glad that you're here, Asedu. Uh, by the way, on uh, our Wednesday broadcast, um, we, Susan, we do have a little bit more room for politics. If you'd like to join us noon at Wednesday, if that's available for you, Eastern Time. Uh, page 27 at the bottom of the Garden of Amuna by Rabbi Shalom Arush. Why are you barking? Suppose that the ticket agent at the airport informs us that the flight has been overbooked and what we must wait until the next flight. We ask, why me? Can't you bump some of the other 300 people on the list? The ticket agent doesn't budge. He doesn't bother listening to what we have to say. So we react with anger. Our hearts beat faster. We clench our fists and we feel the blood rushing into our cheeks. Stressed and bewildered, we don't know whether we should call a lawyer, bang on the counter, or create a scene. Hold on a second. Suppose the flight took off without us and developed engine trouble, crashing into the sea with no survivors. Will we still be angry that we missed our flight? Of course not. With hindsight, we'd understand that Hashem did something that seemed harsh at the time, but was for our ultimate good, to save our life. And by the way, this actually happens more often than you might think. Emuna turns hindsight, as the above example, into foresighted knowledge that Hashem is leading each and every one of us along the very best path. With Emuna, we roll with life's punches, knowing the difficulties, even the failures, are loving expressions of divine providence to help us to attain the perfer perfection of our individual souls. Without Emuna, a person is doomed to a life of confusion, frustration and costly mistakes that could have been avoided had the person heeded Hashem's message. 
Imuna is our best tool. It is not our only tool, if not our only tool, for attaining a soul correction and completing our designated life in mission, our mission in life. Lack of communication. In light of what we've learned until now, a person that ignores Hashem's messages creates a lack of communication with Hashem. Hashem's loving hand tries to direct a mule-headed individual on the right path for his or her own good. But the mule head stubbornly insists on taking the, direct, the different road, a detrimental one. Stubborn people that lack Amuna force Hashem to send them all types of obstacles and hindrances, human and otherwise, to prevent them from wasting their lives or doing damage to themselves. Usually the mule head continues to ignore Hashem's messages, only adding more bitterness and frustration to their lives, oftentimes driving themselves with their own two hands to pills and to psychiatrists. Even more alarming, the mule head fails to understand why he or she lives a life with so much pain and so much bitterness. Those who squander their days trying to satisfy physical appetites while ignoring Hashem's commandments can expect a fate of misery and hard knocks. Why? Because a human driven by a human driven by lust and bodily desires is inferior to an animal. Such people lack the spiritual refinement required to discern the delicate signals from Hashem that say, My son or daughter, you're walking down a dangerous path. When people ignore these delicate symbols, Hashem is forced to catch their attention with louder and with much more severe signals. In short, when they don't hear the gentle whisper, they risk the ear splinter, splinting wail, ear splitting wail of a police fire or, or ambulance siren. King David Hamelech teaches us to seek Hashem's guidance when he pleads at Tehillim 25.5, Lead me in your truth, your truth, not mine, for only you, Hashem, knows what's best for me. He also prays at Tehillim 73.24, May you guide me by your counsel, your counsel, Hashem, and not the counsel of my limited human brain. <clears throat> so maybe you're asking yourself at this point, how do I discern Hashem's messages? How do I know what Hashem really wants from me? <clears throat> With Hashem's loving help, this book will answer those questions and will help you successfully complete your mission on earth. In addition, this book will save you untold headaches and misery and will help you to achieve life's rarest commodity, genuine happiness and satisfaction. There's a famous quote where Rebbe Nachman is asked, How can you tell if a person truly has a Mona and Hashem? The answer is, such a person will be happy. If in your soul you're not happy, if you're feeling unloved, if you're feeling left, I used to have a jokingly, I would say, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I'm going to go eat worms. If that's where you're coming from, the issue is a lack of a Muna. Because with a Muna, you will know that Hashem loves you. So, this is the point of the Garden of Amuna. We're going to stop here this week and continue, Bezrat Hashem, next week with the Garden of Amuna. You have a couple of comments. I do have a couple of comments on there. We didn't get as far as we normally do in the book because of the preface about the fighting that's going on right now in Israel. But this is a really good introduction to the book. Because what Shalom Arush is doing is he's assuming that we are not where we need to be. The assumption of the book is that none of us are really exercising our Amuna properly. From that point... He wants to lead us step by step, showing us how to incorporate, or grok, to use stranger in a strange lands term, to incorporate this knowledge into ourselves. And when we do that, we will have true peace, true knowledge, and true joyousness. I have about an, about an hour or so that I can hang out and just talk with you. If you'd like to talk, ask questions, make comments, or what have you, I'd like to keep it on a non-political perspective. But, uh, but we can do that. I want to thank Ahuva for joining me. 
and for helping us read. Thank you for having me. Of course. And we're going to now look at some of the comments that uh, have come through since here. Um, I should move my thing. <laughs> my camera thing. All right, let's uh, straighten my camera thing back up now for one person. Um, that's actually a little bit too tight, I think. There we go. That's better. And they put that back down there. We just like to look pretty when we can. Because <laughs> you're as we get older, it's a little bit harder to look pretty. Uh, Susan Connor says, "Me, politics, and Facebook are not a good mix." <laughs> Um, well, you know, I, I, people keep telling me I shouldn't talk about politics because we're all coming from different places and so many Jews would disagree with me as far as politically and, and who said you don't want to chase people away, but by the same token, I'm me and what you see is what you get. Um, I don't really, um, I don't really cater to people too well. I just, I'm me, uh, warts and all take it for what it's worth. But I do try to keep politics out of religious broadcasts because they, they really don't belong there. Uh, sometimes they sneak in, though. Guy says, do we sometimes choose our own exile and punishment without knowingly trying? Oh, absolutely, Guy. Absolutely. In fact, I would say most of the time that is precisely what we do. And that's why books like The Garden of the Moon are so important. <clears throat> because Hashem gives us freedom. We can follow whatever path we want. We can accept Hashem or we can reject Hashem. It really is up to us. We're totally free agents within certain boundaries. If we do not wish to know how to live our lives successfully, we will live our lives according to our own guidelines. And typically, we will fail in the grand scheme of things. If we decide, on the other hand, that we want to know and we seek out truth, Hashem will provide it. Perhaps in different ways, according to our taste, according to what we can personally accept. Not everybody could accept the exact same rules that someone else would cleave to. Hashem is very merciful, understanding that we are fallible people. This is part of why he presents himself as a king, as a ruler, as a friend, as so many, in so many different ways because we each relate with God in a unique way. But if we're stubborn, as you say, Guy, if we're pig-headed, if we're just not willing to listen, but still, in our heart, there is goodness, Hashem will continue to throw tribulations in our way. And we have to deal with those tribulations. It might be an illness. It might be a financial collapse. It might be a relationship, a divorce. It could be anything. It could be something minor, like being seemingly minor, like being stuck in a traffic jam or missing your flight. It could be anything. But Hashem will reach out to a person who has a sincere heart, and he will help. If you don't want God's help, if you don't want to know God, then don't ask him to help you, <laughs> because he will. And if you refuse to accept the subtleties that he gives you, he will hammer them home. My example on the way back from Wolverine Campground, I know better. I know the first thing you do is you go to Hashem. But honestly, I didn't. First thing I did was, well, if it's not here, it's got to be somewhere else. And we just started looking. I didn't even think about it, honestly. I'm just being honest with you. Um, but when I did, Hashem said, okay, now the tribulations are over. Here's your wallet. Keeping you humble. Keeping you humble, Mahuva said. Um, so Hashem will guide us, but we have to be open to listening. And... We were both laughing as well after we got the van loaded back up and we're on our way home. We sort of laughed a little bit about it, you know, because it was, there was no reason for it, but then maybe there was a reason for it. So you say, Baruch Hashem, I don't know. Who knows what we missed by being held up for half an hour? Um, who knows? We don't know. So if we're stubborn, Hashem will give us harder and harder tribulations until we finally wake up to it. In terms of the coming of Mashiach, we're told that the Mashiach will come in any generation if the Jews will simply humble themselves and ask and observe a Sabbath or two properly and ask. The Messiah will come. But he doesn't yet. 
And so Hashem keeps putting these, di these difficulties in our way. Why is Israel being attacked right now? Well, it's being attacked because the people, the, the Arabs don't like us. It's attacked because there's a lot of anti-Semitism. All these reasons externally, but it's being attacked by God's will because God controls everything. Hashem is calling the people of Israel to Teshuvah. He's calling the people of Israel to make the state of the Jews into the Jewish nation. Um, and they are facing various tribulations to that degree. Uh, Kelly says, this message was meant for me. I think this message was meant for all of us, Kelly. Thank you, though. Susan says, we have to fight being self-destructive. We do. And that's Guy's point, and that's Shalom Arush's point. We are self-destructive when we think, I can't do this. I can't do this, but I can't do anything. But since Hashem controls everything that happens to me, I can do anything. He says in Psalms 82, um, you are the children of God, but you're going to die like mortals. Arise to your position as the children of God. That's what he wants us to do. How do we do that? Through Amuna, topic of the book. How do we develop our Amuna? Topic of the book. And this book, in all honesty, and I don't say this lightly, is the best guide I've ever read for how a normal person can develop Amuna and come to that place of listening to Hashem. Vitally, vitally important to develop Amuna. Susan says, stop, wait, and listen to your heart. Listen to your heart and make sure that your heart is informed by Torah. <clears throat> because your heart can also lead you astray. This is why Rabbi Nachman was once asked, the Mitnagdim were the orthodox opponents of the Hasids during the early days of Hasidus. And Rebbe Nachman was asked about them. And the Rebbe replied, The Mitnagdim say, study Torah, study Torah. The Hasids say, pray, pray. But I say, study Torah, pray. Study Torah, pray. Our consciousness has to be informed by Torah. Because Torah is the foundation of truth. If our heart urges something that violates Torah, our heart is wrong. And believe me, as you know, the heart can often be wrong. I'm not disagreeing with you, Susan, just building on your point. We have to listen to our heart, but our heart has to be, our consciousness has to be in the right place where we want to know and do Hashem's will. Then when we stop, we will think, we will see I want to do this, but I want to do it for selfish reasons. I want to do this, but it's not really going to be good for me or somebody else. And that is a consciousness that is motivated by the truths of Torah. That is the consciousness that in the Olam Haba will become bathed in Torah when Hashem places his Torah into the heart. And then the scripture says, we won't have to go to anybody else saying, would you teach me? Because each of us will have the Torah written on our own hearts, written within our own consciousness, and we will know. So, bathing the consciousness, coupled with listening to our heart in prayer, is the secret. But why should I study Torah? <clears throat> and why should I pray? If I don't have a Muna, that Torah is the word of Hashem, and that when I pray, Hashem hears me. So both of those go back to Amuna. Without Amuna, you don't have anything. Because without Amuna, there's no reason to study the Torah. Without Amuna, there's no reason to pray. But with Amuna, everything works out. Everything becomes ideal and blissful, even in hard times, even in difficult situations. When things get hard, <coughs> excuse me, when things get hard, Knowing that Hashem is there with us softens the edges. And then we can see in my difficult times, what is Hashem teaching me? Sometimes, frankly, we don't know until it's over. Sometimes we don't even know then. But with the Muna, we will always seek to understand the tribulations, knowing that they come upon us by the will of Hashem. Kelsey Lynn has joined us. Hi, Kelsey. Glad you're here. Susan says, I need... 
to order a new copy of the book. I gave mine away. Yeah, I've given away a few of these too. Um, Garden of Amuna, incredible book. Um, most books, many books, people will say, well, you have to read it five or six times. You know, some movies you have to watch a dozen times to understand. You know. But in the case of this book, it's, I don't think it is true necessarily in all of Shlom Rush's books. But I think in this case, it is true. This book you need to read repeatedly. Um, because this book <clears throat> has, I don't want to say anointed in the sense of the, of the Bible or whatever. I'm not, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that. But this book has God's handprints all over it. God gave Shalom Arush the ability to inspire us with practical examples and practical instructions. And it really is amazing. Veronica says, why would Hashem <clears throat> disdain a person? Uh, there's only one reason he would disdain a person. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is acting up again. The only reason Hashem would disdain a person, and I think it's not even worded, he, he, meant, he says that in the book. If a person decides that they don't want Hashem, that they're going to leave Hashem, then Hashem will leave that person because Hashem gives us the freedom to choose. That's what it means to be created in God's image. God chooses. God has freedom. We, created in his image, have the ability of freedom of choice. <clears throat> so if we say that we don't... <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. If we say, well, I did before I coughed that time. <laughs> if we say that we, um, if we say that we don't want Hashem, then He will leave us to be. And so it's not so much that He disdains us as it is that we have disdained Him, and He is granting us that freedom. Um, Kelsey says hi to everybody. Douglas Year uh, Black has joined us. Hi, Douglas. Glad you're here. Um, Yair. Donald says, at times, one must ask if Hashem should have given the freedom of choice to a few. <clears throat> I would never ask the question, Donald, because if Hashem hadn't given us freedom of choice, even those people who use it poorly, we would be robots. We'd be zombies. If I could not choose not to follow Hashem, I couldn't choose to follow Hashem. If I couldn't choose not to be a bad person, I wouldn't be able to choose to be a good person, and so on. We were created with Yetzir Tov and Yetzir Harad, the path of selflessness and the path of selfishness. It's up to us what we do. <clears throat> and even when we make bad choices, even when we go on the wrong way, even that is the grace of Hashem granting us free will to make our choices. Uh, Maria um, Trifanoi has joined us. Welcome, Maria. Glad that you're here. Uh, Donald says, can't means you don't want to. Um, Pesach has joined us. Uh, see, Donald says, thank goodness I'm not normal, nor do I ever wish to be. Amen. Reuben Viner has joined us. Uh, Sharon says, all things begin with Torah and end with Torah. Absolutely, Susan. Uh, and I said, Hoover says, Amazon links to the book used is available, but will usually have higher shipping cost. Shlomo makes no money from any links, so if you find a different or better source for the book, go for it. Pro tip, check delivery times. Good point. <clears throat> um, yeah, sometimes you'll get a really good price, but you're not going to get the thing for months. Uh, Joseph Zorza is here. Welcome, Joseph. Glad that you're here as well. <clears throat> uh, Joseph Zorza says, French Natalie. Um, Yair says, Jeremiah 17, Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by waters and that spreadeth out his roots by the river. He shall not see heat cometh but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought neither shall cease from yielding fruit the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it the lord searches the heart <coughs> i try excuse me <coughs> i try the reins 
even uh, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Thank you for that, Yair, because that really is the central point. Much of the modern philosophy is sort of this new age idea of the inner deity, deity or divinity or something. Um, if the heart's not trained, the heart will go astray. Because the heart has to choose between Yetzir Tov and Yetzir Hara. Yetzir Hara is far more appealing. Me, me, me is far more appealing than you, you, you. You know, we are, I, my generation was called the me generation. I think we were part of the me generation. Uh, this idea that greed is good, as said in that famous movie. Um, but a person who bathes his consciousness in Hashem like a tree by the river that's watered by the water of the river, such a person will live a truly meaningful life, a truly happy life, because such a person will not be afraid of Hashem or of his fellow man. Nothing can happen to hurt you that Hashem doesn't permit. You can't suffer poverty or loss or indignity or any of these things unless... It is in, unless Hashem is teaching you through these things. Hashem is in control. And so that brings peace. And that brings true happiness. Uh, Kathy Witter Castleberry and uh, Sharon Bates. Ren Ruana has joined us. Welcome. Glad that you're here as well. Um, Susan says the water is Torah. Absolutely. The water is Torah. And we are Jews collectively are called the tree. And a tree, Israel, planted by the waters of Torah, is nurtured from that water through its roots. What are the roots? Us. We are the roots of the tree that grow from the water of Torah. And so, if we're doing that, I know you know this, Susan, but if we're doing that, then when we listen to our hearts, we're listening to Torah. We're listening to what Hashem is revealing to us from within. And we're happy and we're joyful even when things go seemingly wrong. And I always like to say a lot of the authors, including Shalom Arush, likes to say the, the good and the seemingly bad. I say the seemingly good and the seemingly bad. Because a lot of things happen that I think are good that end up not being good. You know, we read all these stories about people who win the lottery. Oh, they're so lucky. They're going to have $1,000 every day for life. How lucky they are. It ends up ruining their lives. Absolutely destroying their lives. So that seemingly good was actually very detrimental to them because they didn't use it for Hashem and for righteousness. And the people who lost the lottery, they're oftentimes blessed to avoid all those hassles and all of the, the foolishness that comes along with winning the lottery. So, Baruch Hashem, and that's the point. My current banner on my page says, Direct Hashem, the rest is, com or uh, no, it says, uh, Hashem Echad, the rest is commentary. If we can remember, Direct Hashem, Hashem Echad, we will have a happy life, no matter what happens. Dennis said, would proper teshuva preclude reincarnation? No, not, uh, in fact, reincarnation can be part of your teshuva. Um, those of us who believe in reincarnation or Gilgul Neshamat absolutely believe that uh, a person will experience what they experience in order to make Teshuva. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, the last Lubavitcher Rebbe, Reb Schneerson, said to the shock of his hearers, and they were shocked when he said it, there are Gentiles who are born in Jewish bodies, and there are Jews who are born in Gentile bodies both sides for the purpose of teshuva. We have our halakha for identifying who is and who is not a Jew, but we can't actually say. Only Hashem knows that. We can say who we accept as Jews. That's where some of the current controversies come from. But when a person reincarnates, he reincarnates with a certain purpose, a certain lesson in mind. Um, I don't know how literally to take this, but... There are rabbis who teach us that in order for a Jew to attain the Olam Haba, they have to have fulfilled all 613 commandments. So, if you have fulfilled 612 commandments, you may come back to fulfill the last one. We have stories about that happening. The famous story, I've shared it before, about the very pious couple 
their whole life, all they wanted to do was have a child so they could fulfill the mitzvah, so the husband could fulfill the mitzvah of having a child. And uh, they got, they lived, and they tried, and they tried, and they're up in their 80s and 90s, still no child came. So they went to the rabbi, and they said, a rabbi, a visiting Torah scholar rabbi, it's said, rabbi, why is it that we have lived our whole life, our lives of teshuva, worshiping Hashem, and he has not granted us this wonderful blessing? So the rabbi said, Say, come back next year, you will, you will have a baby. Sure enough, the whole community became excited over in a small shtetl. The whole shtetl became very excited, and they helped the woman. They, they helped her with everything to have a perfect birth, and she had the baby. The baby was born, and the community celebrated, and it was such a wonderful, joyous time. It, the whole community felt like they had had the child. The whole community was ecstatic over this miraculous child. And at eight days, they brought the child into the synagogue, and the rabbi circumcised the child, the moral circumcised the child, and the community was just elated. About a week later, the child caught the flu and died. The community was devastated. And they go to the rabbi and they say, Rabbi, how could this have happened? And the rabbi says, I'm going to have to check with Hashem on this one. So the rabbi leaves and goes into, into hit but do it for an extended period of time, begging Hashem for the understanding. And then he comes back and he explains that that was a very pious soul of a certain great rabbi. The only mitzvah of the 613 that he had not fulfilled was being circumcised on the eighth day in his last life. Because in his last life, he had gotten sick and the doctors had ruled that circumcision would be too dangerous. So in this life, he had the circumcision and then he died because he fulfilled all 613 commandments and it was a blessing of Hashem to prevent him from growing up and possibly committing sins. We don't know. We do not understand. And that honestly, that is one of the most important spiritual lessons that any of us need to learn. We think we know. We study the Torah. We study the Talmud. We listen to great rabbis. We spend hours in hit bodedut. We seek to know and we think, I know some things. We don't know anything. All we really know is Hashem Echad. And that is enough. Hashem Echad. Trust in Hashem. Hashem will get us through. Whether that requires reincarnations, whether that requires no incarnations, perhaps a person will end this life and they will simply rest until the great resurrection in the Messianic age. Uh, perhaps they will come back again. Perhaps they will come back several times. Again, we don't know. I know from personal experience that Gilgal Neshamat is true, as I've shared several times. Um, I have never questioned the truth of it, even when it would have been expedient for me to question it. But we shouldn't think of teshuva as being a one-time thing. I committed this sin and I'm going to make teshuva because that's really honestly not what teshuva is. I mean, yeah, teshuva means to, to do a, you know to turn around and go the opposite direction. But but teshuva should be our life. We should live a life of teshuva. And the moment we get off of derech Hashem, the moment we get off the path, we should say, "Whoops, sorry, Hashem, get back on the path." If we live a life of awareness, if we live a life of teshuva, we will mainly stay on the path. And Bezrat Hashem, we will please Hashem. Why would we want to be on the path? Why would we want to do any of this? Amuna. Amuna is the secret, it is the key, it is the driving force that leads to a good life, to a happy life. It's the key that leads to everything else spiritually in Muna. Hence, back in 1997, I named my website allfaith.com. It's all about faith. It's all about Amuna. It's not about the incidentals that we do. We do the incidentals because we have Amuna, that those incidentals please Hashem. 
And being in love with Hashem, we want to please Him. But we don't please Him because we do the incidentals. <clears throat> we please Him because He pleases us and because we are choosing to follow Him. The incidentals are simply a way that we manifest our love for Him. This is a secret that the Bel Shem Tov spoke on quite a bit that this important level of consciousness consciousness is vital the externals of worship are important but it is the consciousness that motivates us so a person asked a while back do I have to do the mitzvah even if I don't agree or understand them and the answer is you should do the mitzvah because the mitzvah will drink will, will draw you to Hashem even if you don't know why you're doing it. But doing the mitzvahs with understanding is far better because doing the mitzvah <clears throat> with intention and with consciousness and with doing it deliberately with the muna makes the mitzvah, whatever mitzvah you're talking about, far more powerful and far more glorious. Do we have any other questions or comments? Um, so again, if you don't have the book, The Garden of Amuna, I, I, I urge you, actually, I urge you to buy this book. Normally I say, you know, and you can, of course, be here without buying the book. But I normally will say things like, you know, it's a good idea to buy the book for your studies, but not necessarily that. This one I would really buy, and Direct Hashem also. These are two books you really do want to buy. And uh, you want to spend time going through them. Um, it's sort of interesting. Direct Hashem, which we're doing on Thursdays, is a very complicated book. And you're going to want to study that book because it's so complicated. This book, you're going to be amazed as we go through it how simple it is. And you want to study this book hard because within its simplicity is total profound knowledge. These two books are almost the opposites of each other in a way. And both of them require deep and earnest study to really be able to get out of them what is in them to be had. Stephen says, I was reading Direct Hashem, page 41 to be specific. It made me think a little. Hashem made a creation that is its own. This requires, at some level, at, this requires concealment of Hashem at some level, as otherwise it would be one. Because of this concealment of Hashem, there must be a creature that has the ability to become concealed. Would this make it man a necessary creation, Hashem, to create? Meaning that the creation of man would be inevitable. You do make total sense, uh, Stephen. However, I would have to disagree with your conclusion. The reason is... If Hashem were limited in time and space, he would have to have man. You cannot know. You can have heat and cold, but you cannot know what heat is unless you have a sense of what cold is. You can't know what darkness is if you don't have a concept of what light is. Um, but Hashem dwells beyond all duality. Hashem, as Ein Sof, is absolutely beyond all limits, all duality, and all boundaries. Therefore, within Ein Sof is everything. And within Ein Sof is nothing, because nothing exists other than that which is within Ein Sof. So, that's why I would have to disagree. I, I follow your reasoning, and it, it's actually it's a good point. Um... It was in the mind of Hashem, as we'll be discussing as we get further into Rek Hashem, we're beginning in part two, um, looking at um, divine providence, and then we're going to go back pretty soon, actually, to the beginning of the book and go through, because I think understanding divine providence, uh, as my friend Shlomo Silverman pointed out, will help us with the beginning of the book. But... For reasons that 
we don't comprehend and can't comprehend the absolute, and you can't even say oneness of Hashem because that implies there's something else. The absolute being of transcendence decided to manifest self in material existence. There was no need, there was no reason why Ein Sof needed to do that. Ein Sof doesn't need to do anything. The rabbis typically say that the reason that Ein Sof did was out of a desire to experience and give love. But if we take Ein Sof as we're presented, Ein Sof is also the personification of all love, and so that argument breaks down. We try to explain things beyond our ken, and nine times out of ten when we do that, there's the other hand. There's a yeah, but. Um, the nature of Ein Sof, which is God beyond God, the nature of Ein Sof is absolutely and utterly transcendent to all human consciousness. For what we call love, Ein Sof manifests self in a way that we can conceive. This we call Hashem. This we call Elohim, the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord, Lord, Master of masters. And then as recorded in Exodus 6, 3, um, Elohim, uh, Elohim revealed the sacred name to us. Um, but the sacred name is the knowable. Ein Sof is beyond the knowable. We refer to God as a he, typically. But Hashem is not a he or a she. The nature of God transcends all gender. Utterly and utterly beyond us. But it is a good point. Um, Alexander Tasik has joined us. Welcome, Alexander. Alexander. Uh, Susan says, and we humans are not capable of understanding. And, right, Susan, and that's exactly the point. So, we honestly can't say anything <laughs> about that level of being. Um, but if you tell a Jew you can't understand that, you're going to have an interesting time as the Jew tries to do it anyway. We don't like can't for an answer. We don't like you can't do that. We're, if you tell me we can't do that, we're going to figure out a way to do it. Um, and so our great philosophers and religious leaders and our great Sadakim and our great mystics have delved into these uh, these topics in incredible depth, and they have revealed to us uh, writings and truths that seem to go beyond human consciousness themselves. And when we read these things repeatedly, we find that they bring us to an ever deeper level. In Hasidus, we refer to this level as devachut, the, uh, the attachment of a soul to the Creator. And we discover that we are attaching ourselves to greater and greater depths progressively. Susan says, nothing is beyond Hashem mysteries of Kabbalah. Well, yeah, but you got to listen to how I said that, Susan. Hashem is the manifest known of Ein Sof. Nothing is beyond Hashem, of course. God forbid the thought. But Hashem is nonetheless a manifestation that we can sort of get our, our, our heads around. If there is Hashem, there is not Hashem. Ein Sof transcends our ability of comprehension even beyond the level of our comprehension of Hashem. Certainly nothing is beyond Hashem. Um, but Hashem is the named. There is something beyond the named. There is the nameless. There is what we call Ein Sof, which refers to no thing. Not nothing, but no thing. A thing has a name. Hashem is a name. The name. Ein Sof has no name. Ein Sof is beyond all names. That was my point. You are absolutely correct. Um, 
Which, in fact, brings us back to your very point, which is that we're struggling to understand, but our understandings by their very nature are going to be limited. Donald says, that was the reason for my comment, read can't means you don't want to. Yeah, so it is, it's beyond. We, but even though, even though we want to understand Hashem fully, we can't because Hashem is way beyond us. And even in the Olam Haba, when the Torah is written on our hearts and when the, the Tzadikim will reach a new levels of Tzadik where they're just mind-blowingly one, they still will not fully know God because God is utterly transcendent. Now, is there a point when the Olam Haba will flip into eternity? Um, there's some fascinating discussions on that point as well. Um, but we don't understand. Susan says we wrestle with understanding, always striving to that. And that's the thing. We're wrestling to understand. That's what, in fact, one of the deaf, one of the translations of Israel means. You see who wrestles with God. We're wrestling to understand. Um, when you're on sort of a surface earthly kind of a level, it's really easy to say, you know, you know, God is love and God is kind and mercy, but God is just. And what you're saying is not true because it violates Torah. What you're saying is true because it agrees with Torah. And it, it's pretty clear. But as you get to these levels where you begin talking about mysticisms and Kabbalah and transcendence, things become so the lines become so finite as to be virtually invisible. And we're all reaching for that which is beyond us. And that is our eternal occupation as Jews, in part, to reach beyond what we now know at my now level, your now level, to reach beyond to a higher and a higher and a higher plateau to a higher knowing of Hashem. That is our goal as Jews. That is our goal as human beings. <clears throat> we want to know. And there are limitations, Donald. I'm sorry. There are things we just can't do. We can never, as far as we can conceive of never, we can never fully know Hashem. But we can attach ourselves to be upward into the 90 percentiles, such as Rebbe Nachman of Breslau, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Nicholsburg Rebbe, so many great Rebbe's. We can reach those heights if we devote ourselves to Hashem and if we receive His mercy and His blessings. Donald says, it is better to try and fall than, yeah, and, then not try, and that's the point. Um, Rabbi A was explaining um, to a couple of us, I'm not sure who was all present at up at Wolverine, that we see things in the news um, like what's happening right now. In fact, I think you may have been referring to this current situation. And it looks to us to be bad. And we start thinking, well, why is this happening? This is terrible. Rabbi A said, no, this has to happen. And the reason it has to happen is is that Hashem, again, gives us freedom. If Hashem says, come to this level, and we're here, and we refuse to come to that level, Hashem will put situations to make us go down to this level, and then to make us go down to this level, until we get so desperate that we finally surrender to Him and say, Hashem, help me. And then, before you know it, we're above the level, on our way up. Two, uh, three steps forward, two steps back kind of a thing. Um, because Hashem is our eternal well-wisher. And Hashem is leading us to Him point by point. And that was the topic of the book today. Leading us to Him step by step through all of the tribulations that we suffer. Welcome to da Donna Palfrey and to Teshuva Ben Avraham. Uh, glad that you're both here. Step by step, Hashem is leading us to Him. Step by step, He is leading us to make teshuva, to make repentance, to put our confidence and our faith in Him alone, to realize that He alone 
is our hope. He alone is our source and he alone is our destination. And all of our tribulations and all of our hardships and trials lead us to that central revelation. When we can have, when we develop our imuna to know everything that happens is for our best. Everything that happens, happens by the will of God. And everything that happens, happens to draw us closer to Hashem. When we realize that and act upon it, our lives become sublime. Even when confronting difficulties. Other questions, thoughts, or comments? Um, but this is why I love this book so much. Because a lot of people will make those comments in passing... But they don't focus, that's what Rabbi was saying, there's plenty of books that make those points in passing. But there's not very many books that will say, now let's talk about how you get from here to here. That's what this book does. And we've already seen examples of that. Your airline ticket is, you bought in advance, you should be on the plane, but they overbooked and you don't get on the plane. How do you react? If you've got Amuna and Hashem, you say, Baruch Hashem. Now, it will be discussed as the time goes by. That does not mean that we should become um, doormats under people's feet either. Some people who embrace this philosophy become whip noodles. They just, oh, it's all God's will. Whatever God wants is cool. That's not it either. I guarantee you, Shalom Arush is a fighter. Um, when the Holocaust was over and the, state, the nation of Israel was being founded, um, it was stated there on the floor of the Knesset, never again. Never again means we fight back. Never again means that many Jews now are using care are carrying weapons with them. Many Jews now are joining the Israeli military. Many Jews, American Jews, my in fact we're meeting with a dear friend Tuesday, who is an American Jew who is currently serving in the IDF and is at home on leave visiting family. We're going to be getting together with he and his wife on Tuesday, Bezrat Hashem, before they go back to Israel. Um, so, like the comment that he made earlier, that if you don't have a tribulation come into your life for, I think it was two or three weeks, then you have forfeited the Olam Haba, right? Don't take those kind of statements li that literally. The point is, if everything in your life just keeps going wonderfully, you should stop and think, am I really where God wants me to be? Because if I was doing what God wants me to be doing, there would be some tribulation. That was the point. We have to keep a balanced mindset, especially in the early part of this book. The only complaint I've got about the Garden of Amuna is that at the early phases, he goes a little bit radical on applying Amuna. In the second half of the book, he mellows it as he explains things, but he doesn't do that in the beginning of the book. Uh, I'll be pointing some of those out like I did today when we get to those. But Amuna is the key to everything. Amuna is the key to happiness. Amuna is the key to wealth. Amuna is the key to a happy marriage. It is the key to a successful business. It is the key to successful everything. It is the key to overcoming depression anger, anxiety, um, conceit, um, self-debasement. Amuna is the cure for everything. Because a person who lives a life of Amuna is a person who lives in the perpetual presence of the Most High God and who knows that everything that happens happens by the will of God for our ultimate good. Such a person never needs to be afraid, never needs to be angry, but can stand up for himself, sure. 
Nothing wrong with that. Again, this balance is so important. Susan says it's difficult to find a place to stop reading. Just keeps getting better and better. That, Susan, is a very true statement. Uh, what we do here in all the books is I have a Hoover go through first. And she puts these little uh, stickers in it. So when we get to those stickers, we change readers. And I can't tell you how many times she says, well, if I stop here, we're stopping in the middle of something. If I stop here with this person, I read too long. You know, it's, uh, it's hard <laughs> to do that. This really is a book you just want to get a cup of tea and just sit down on your favorite ca comfy couch and just spend the day reading. But we are going to be doing it by dividing it up into segments of about an hour each, or about 50 minutes actually each time. Uh, and I really am glad, glad that you're all here and that you are here for the, um, for the initial reading of, uh, of the Garden of Amuna with us. Welcome to Dan uh, Barwell. Glad that you're here, Dan. Um, and do remember that Bezrat Hashem, each of these sessions will be put onto YouTube so that you can follow them uh, and get the entire series that way. Um, so it will be available. So if you miss one, you can always go to go to my YouTube and catch up on it. Um, and I think that we are done for today. Uh, again, I want to ask that each of us would be very mindful to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and all of Israel, and to pray for the Jews of Israel, and to pray for the Jews of the diaspora, because. We are approaching Tisha B'Av. And Tisha B'Av, which I'll be writing on more as we get a little bit closer, Tisha B'Av is a historically incredibly significant day um, in the life of the Jewish people. This year, Tisha B'Av will begin nightfall um, or sunset, actually, July 21st until sun till nightfall, Sunday, July 22nd. Uh, today's the 15th as I'm doing this, so we are not so far off. But please, please, please pray for our people who are going to be under increasing attacks in all likelihood as we approach um, Tisha B'Av. Welcome to uh, Luis Diaz B. We're about to leave, Luis. Uh, Luis, uh, Lu Luis. Um, but you, as I was saying, you can find this on YouTube once I finish here. It takes me about a half an hour, 15 minutes to get it posted over to YouTube. <clears throat> hey, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Uh, if I had Reb Zeta here, I'd have him sing, a, sing happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, though. Um, to Maria Mills, I mean, I mean, to uh, to Susan Connors, uh, wonderful son. Uh, I don't usually mention names on here who are not present, especially minors, for I think, unfortunately, obvious reasons. But happy birthday! We really have a wonderful, blessed birthday. Uh, Donald says, "Look forward to seeing everybody on Wednesday." Me too, and thank you, Veronica. I don't usually forget. This time, I almost did. Um, so. Let's start with Sunday's schedule. Today is Sunday, tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern Time Zone. If you would like to join the All Heart Meeting, the All Heart Meeting is not broadcast. It is on Google Hangouts. Uh, we invite people to the All Heart Meeting who are interested in taking part in Tikkun Olam from a very directive perspective. Right now, uh, the people in All Heart are creating blankets. They're crocheting blankets that will be delivered to women who have suffered miscarriages and similar situations as a way to bring comfort uh, to these women. Um, and uh, so if you crochet, if you would like to learn how to crochet, if you'd like to get involved, you need to join our All Heart Tacoon group Veronica has posted the link to it. Click there, join the link, answer the basic questions. We don't care there if you're Jewish, Christian, or whatever. It doesn't matter. Everybody is welcome in this particular group. <clears throat> There's no religion discussed. It's not a religious group. It is a group for working towards blessing people. You're welcome to join the group. 
uh, to join the broadcast, you need to be involved actively in the, uh, the current project. To join the broadcast, in the group, you will see an event link. Click the event link and let Veronica know that you want to be there. Then make sure you send Veronica the, the Google Hangout email address that you use, and she will invite you to the group. Veronica is in charge of that group, and she'll be inviting you at about 10, five, 5 or 10 minutes before 8 if she has your email address, on the one you use on Google Hangouts. has to be that one. Um, if you need help with that, I think the events tab gives information, or you can contact Veronica or Donald for information on doing that. I'm not as tech savvy as some people seem to think I am, and frankly, I get confused on Google Hangouts. Uh, Susan says he'll be 38. Oi. Okay. I think he was a little, one of the little guys. Um, uh, ha uh, happy 38th then. Yeah, I can relate. Well, ours are like 35 or something. I just... It goes so fast. Happy birthday. Uh, Maria says, thank you, Rabbi Shlomo and Donald Willinger. Thank you, Maria. We always appreciate you. Uh, Donald, thank you. I'm glad you were able to come. I know you were a little bit late because you're not feeling well. I'd also like to encourage people. I'm going to be posting on this when we get a little bit closer. But Donald does have some serious health issues that are on his, well, not quite worded right. Donald has some serious health issues. He has surgeries on the horizon, and um, I'm going to be posting more specifics about that as we get closer, because last I heard, he doesn't have dates and stuff quite yet, but please be in prayer for our brother and friend, Donald Willinger. Um, Donald, as all of you know, is just a superhuman being, wonderful man, um, one of my best friends, and... Um, we want to be in prayer for him um, as his healthcare professionals go through and uh, look at his condition and decide how best to help him. And Baruch Hashem, he seems to have some good people helping him. So please be in prayer for Donald Willinger. Um, Veronica says, and if you haven't signed up for the Noahide newsletter yet, please do. Veronica puts out an awesome Noahide newsletter. You don't have to be a Noahide to sign up. A lot of Jewish stuff ends up in the newsletter as well. But uh, please sign up. She's posted the link for the Noahide newsletter. Even if you read it online in the Noahide group, still, please sign up. Because signing up for the list lets Veronica know that people are watching it or reading it. And that the time that she's putting into it is worth all of her wonderful, wonderful efforts. She's got some plans, um, new plans coming up for some new information we're going to be expanding this, and uh, it's going to be a pretty exciting situation. So please sign up for Noah Hyde Newsletter. Thank you, Veronica. And Veronica, if you wouldn't mind, if you could also post links to Kosher Cooking, uh, I would appreciate that. Uh, Miroslav Lav Amantunsky has joined us. Donald says, so let me, all right, so we're going to order. All right, so tonight it's all heart, the discussion group. Then Wednesday it will be um, what now? Or now what? Or now Donald's saying what next? <laughs> we keep changing the name of the show. It's what now, what next, now what uh, on Wednesday. The basic point is actually the same, however. You've gotten to this point in your life. What next? What now? Now what? What do you do from here? Quit the self-judgment. Quit the self-judging and the condemnations and the coulda, woulda, shoulda. Here you are today. Now, what do you do next? The Wednesday broadcast is mainly an open discussion where we just talk with folks about life, about possibility, and that type thing. Donald has a, a short segment on positive, primarily news happening in Israel that he shares on the hour as well in the Wednesday group. Please join us for What Next right here on my wall this coming and every coming Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern time. I hope you'll join us. Uh, Dennis says something very odd. It probably means something. O-K-B-I-F-N. O-K-B... I don't know what this stands for, Dennis. Sorry. Uh, Susan says, I'm old, Rabbi. I'm old. Oh, tell me about it, Susan. Tell me about it. When your kids start getting gray hair, you know you're in trouble. Um, 
one of our kids started losing his hair when he was in high school. I was, I've was i been feeling old for a long time. <laughs> Donna laughs and says, Susan, I'm so old that I've forgotten, but I think I met Moses. I'm so old, Donald, that I forgot about being so old to meet Moses. Anyway, uh, we're never going to have a little kind of, I'm older than you are, uh, <laughs> which is also human nature. Susan says, uh, Rafua Shlima to Donald. Absolutely, Donald, Rafua Shlima. Um, and uh, let's see here. Um, absolutely. Donald says, Susan Port is a super editor. We love her for sharing. Oh, also, uh, Su- um Veronica would also love it if you would send, if you're Noahide, if you would send in a, a testimony of some sort, how you became a Noahide, what your process was like. If you're Jewish and you know about Noahide and you're one of those people like me who writes a lot and you've written something about Noahide, please submit that to Veronica as well. Like Donald said, Veronica is a super editor. Uh, she will help you edit it if it needs to be edited. And um, she is in charge of everything over there. Uh, submit to Veronica Port for the Noahide newsletter. We want, we request, we would love to have your submissions. Veronica just posted the link to Kosher Cooking. Thank you. Kosher Cooking is primarily Donald's group, um, which basically shares recipes on Kosher Cooking, uh, talks about what makes something kosher. We talk a little bit about how to cashier your oven or your kitchen. Um, how to question whether or not this animal is kosher or not, how to grow a garden with kosher foods, and so on and so forth. Kosher Cooking Kosher, K-O-O-K-I-N-G, at Facebook's group. And Veronica has kindly posted us the link. Please join us there. Susan Connor says that Amuna will get you to the other side of surgery in good shape. Very true. Um I began the broadcast actually saying that this was very relevant because the people of Israel need to strengthen their amuna when they're under attack. Donald, who is going to be going into surgery, not probably sometime this week, uh, needs to strengthen his amuna, though his amuna is very strong, I can tell you personally. But strong amuna will help get you to the other side. Uh, Knowing that absolutely everything that happens, happens by the will of Hashem knowing that Jews are personally watched over by Hashem, knowing that your surgeons will be directly led by Hashem, inspired by Hashem, that Hashem will put in the, the minds of the surgery, surgeon to see something that might have been missed and so on. Um, in fact, really, if there's anything after the 26th, okay, thank you, Donald. Yeah, I, hadn't, I wasn't sure. Okay, after the 26th. So that's good, actually, after Tisha B'Av, is you really don't want surgery on Tisha B'Av. Um, I'm glad that you're going to hold off till then. Um, but if I have one wish for you other than a complete recovery and everything, it is Amuna to look to Hashem for everything in your surgery. Um, have faith in Hashem, and we will be praying for you with our Amuna. And we pray that Hashem will react and respond with blessings upon you and with upon everyone who prays for you. In fact, remember, uh, Bereshit 12.3 says that Hashem will bless those who bless Israel. What is Israel? Israel is more than a country. Israel are the Jewish people. Israel is named after the Jews, not the other way around. So if you will all bless Donald, if you will all pray for Donald, <clears throat> for this upcoming surgery, I guarantee you, Hashem will bless you um, because you will be blessing Israel. Israel is Donald Willinger. Israel is every individual Jew. So when you bless the Jewish people, you bless Hashem. And Hashem blesses you. So thank you so much, everybody. I truly appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and close with the song by the Brills. Oh, actually, we didn't finish. So Wednesday, we have what next? Thursday at 12 noon, we're going to be continuing the book, Direct Hashem, The Way of God. We are reading the Arya Kaplan translation. We may do the uh, larger uh, ex- um, elucidated uh, version after this, if there's still interest. But this book is awesome. 
Rabbi Area Kaplan's version of the one of the way of God. Please join us for Wednesday noon for that book. Then Thursday night we will have our One God Seven Laws Noahide group, which we are studying. This is my God by Herman Wook and general open Noahide discussions. So we're busy around here. And don't forget, Sabbath, join us at the House of Seven Beggars at 8 p.m. Uh, Friday evening and 10 a.m. Sabbath morning for our services. After the High Holy Days, Rabbi A will then resume his broadcast schedule of classes as well. Um I think you probably all know, but I haven't announced this yet on this broadcast. So last Monday, Hashem blessed me with Smika, which means that I am now officially a rabbi. I am now officially a Sephardic rabbi. Um, and so uh, that was a tremendous blessing for me. And uh, I'm going to be hooked up directly with the House of Seven Beggars. Rabbi A and I are going to have a meeting, I think, on t Tuesday to discuss some of the details of this. Um, but, um, we are definitely going to be unifying, not, that's not the right word, allfaith.com, the house of seven beggars and yeshiva for all Jews under the laws of Moses are going to be working together intimately as we go into the future. I have spoken with, um, I've spoken with Rabbi Ansel Solomon who is the one of the two Rosh Yeshivas of our Yeshiva. Uh, Rabbi, Nach, Rabbi Ariel Nachman is the other Rosh. We have two Roshes. Um, collaborating. Thank you, Susan. That's the word I was looking for. The three, play, the three groups will be collaborating together, but AllFaith.com is going to maintain its independence. The House of Seven Beggars is going to maintain its independence, and our Yeshiva will be maintaining its independence, but we'll be collaborating on various projects. That's exactly the word I was looking for, Susan. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, Rabbi Ansel has agreed to do a broadcast with me. Uh, I'm really excited about it because I wasn't really thinking he would. He's a sort of a private man. Uh, he lives. He's the uh, he's the chief rabbi of the Dominican Republic. Um, I'm going to talk to him, and um, we'll be going back and forth by emails over the next few days, and we'll come up with a time for him. So watch my Facebook feed for information on when that interview will be. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. You're going to love Ansel. Ansel, wait and see. You're going to like Ansel Solomon. Um, he prefers not to be called rabbi because he's an incredibly humble man. Uh, I don't personally care what you call me. Call me rabbi. Just don't call me late for dinner. Whenever I call rabbi, rabbi, or rabbi, he says, no, 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 just call me Ansel. Okay, Ansel. Um, <clears throat> I think there's something to be said for using titles. Um, and I think people who want to be called by a title need humility. So that's always been my thing has always been call me what you want. Uh, personally, I call rabbi a rabbi. I don't call him our Ariel, although he told me I could, I call him rabbi a, he's my rabbi. Um, so, um, call me whatever you want. But we will be having this uh, uh, video, uh, a Facebook broadcast with uh, my Rebbe, uh, Rebbe Ansel Solomon coming up. And I'll be letting you know as soon as I know about that one. That's going to be awesome. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, Susan says, words are my life, court reporter. Um, so... But, you know, part of the things have just gotten so confusing these days. I know people <clears throat> that have rabbinic ordination that I won't call rabbi um, because I just don't think they deserve it or because they're teaching things that are just flat out wrong, heresy-wise. There's other people like Shlomo Silverman, if you're still here, who does not have smika but who is absolutely a rabbi. Um... There, I have several Jews in my life who I consider to be rabbis. This was part of that whole consideration. Uh, my friend Reb, Reb Zev, who we had done the broadcast with for a while there, two Rebs and a Cohen, um, he's a rabbi. Um, and I've always said that. I think a rabbi is a teacher, and it, it's there's a ritual side of it. But 
there are people with smikas who, in my opinion, are not rabbis. And there's people without smikas, in my opinion, who are. Um, words matter. And the use of titles... If you use a title for somebody, it puts you in a position where you're reminding yourself of why you're in the relationship. And that's a powerful thing that referring to someone as rabbi so-and-so does. Um, when I go see my doctor, I call him doctor. <clears throat> you know, I said, doctor, would you tell me this? Doctor, would you tell me that? Because I'm not there to be his friend. I'm there because I believe he has knowledge that I need. Or skills that I need. So I've always thought that titles were important. Um, but for some people, titles can be a stumbling block. Because they start wanting to title because that means that I'm something. And that's a real bad thing. That's a serious spiritual flaw if you want that. Um, and there's other people that I know that if they feel they have to call someone by a title it means they're not going to talk to them because they feel overwhelmed somehow. Um, and I get that. So I don't care. I don't know quite know how I tripped onto this from Ansel, but I rather than calling him Ansel, not Rabbi Ansel, because you get in a habit of calling him Ansel because he doesn't want me to call him Rabbi Ansel. But on the broadcast, I'm going to call him Rabbi unless he tells me not to because we're going to be publicly doing this. Anyway, um, thank you so much, everybody. Stay tuned. We have some really cool things coming. I'm very, very excited uh, about the direction that we're taking. And uh, we'll be sharing a lot more about our new yeshiva. Um, I'm going to be on the board of it. Rabbi A and Rabbi Ansel are going to be the shared Rosh Yeshiva. And uh, we have a couple of really good rabbis also who are going to be on the board um, of the yeshiva. So we're very excited. And uh, when we get Rabbi Ansel on here, he'll be telling you more about it as well. Uh, Susan says, the judge I worked for wanted me to use his first name. Out of respect for him, I could not. Now that we are both retired, I do, but it's hard. Yeah, I know. That's what I feel. Um, I keep struggling with Rabbi Ansel for that exact reason. Um, you know, some of it is I, I grew up in the South, so there's a Southern accent thing there. Um, I don't know where, where any of this stuff comes from, but uh, I... I, th I think I, I like titles and I use them for my, my, my spiritual leaders and others who have titles. But again, I really don't get wigged out either way. So call me Shlomo, call me Rabbi Shlomo, call me Rav, Reb, I don't care. Whatever you want to call me now, you can do it. And no one's going to be writing me mean emails or PM saying, you shouldn't let them call you that, which I was getting before. <laughs> so now I can say... I don't care. Call me whatever you want. Just don't call me late for dinner. As you can tell, I like dinner. <laughs> Thank you, friends. God bless you all. I appreciate every one of you so much. You just have no idea. I'm going to go ahead and end now with my friend the Brills singing Yerushalayim. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Bezrat Hashem. Karov, 
Hashem, we pray, we ask you that you would protect the people of Israel, that you would protect the soldiers of the IDF, 
that you would protect all of those people who are securing the borders of Israel against these attacks, that you would keep everyone in Israel safe, Hashem, that you would thwart the plans of our enemies, that you would empower the Iron Dome to take down ever more of these missiles as they're coming into the country. We pray, Hashem, that you'd be with your people around the world, no matter where they are, that you would keep all the Jews safe, that you would keep safe all those who love Israel and all those who stand with your people, and that you would bring about the coming of Mashiach bin David, and you would bring us all freedom, and you would bring us all into the Olam Haba, where everyone will know your name, and everyone will join hands in praise of your righteousness. Thank you, Hashem.